Euh, bonjour tout le monde, euh, bonjour Eva, donc euh, est-ce que toi tu t'occupes des, des, euh, euh, de la salle d'attente ou est-ce qu'on enlève juste la salle d'attente Moi ça ne me dérange pas, je garde un œil dessus hein, pour, euh, pour admettre les gens, donc il n'y a pas de problème. D'accord, ok. Moi on peut juste, euh, bon, je ne sais pas trop si on a besoin. On peut l'enlever, c'est juste que je ne suis pas sûre de comment on fait. <rire> ah mais moi, je peux le faire, hein. je peux l'enlever, c'est très simple. Parce que mais dans tous les cas, il euh, y a pas mal de gens que je ne connais pas, alors euh, je, je les admets comme ça. <rire> oui, je pense qu'on peut, on peut y aller comme ça, c'est pas un souci. Voilà. Comme ça, on n'est pas obligé de, de regarder tout le temps. Et Benoît, je, euh, est-ce que tu as donné ton, ton consentement pour euh, enregistrer et euh, publier euh, Je ne l'ai non, mais je veux bien le donner là tout de suite, oui. Bon, je pense que ça suffit comme ça. Donc, comme ça, parce que comme, comme c'est déjà ça dans l'enregistrement, je ne sais pas où. Euh, Eva, est-ce que tu, tu as un formulaire pour ça Non, je n'ai pas de formulaire. Généralement, je demande juste avant de lancer l'enregistrement. D'accord. Comme là, c'est déjà lancé. Mais tu fais la présentation en anglais, non Benoît Oui, c'est ce que j'ai prévu, mais je peux la faire en français si vous pouvez. Non, 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 c'est très bien, c'est très bien, c'est parfait. <rire> Bonjour. Bonjour. Bon, je pense que pendant que les gens se connectent, je peux déjà, déjà faire l'intro un peu. So, welcome everybody to the Deep Distinguished Lectures. And uh, given the occasion, I just uh, insp got inspired for the introduction. I just uh, I used uh, ChatGPT, and uh, I guess that uh, since Benoit did that as well. So, Hello, everybody. Dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's talk, Benoit Krabi, a distinguished scholar and professor of computational linguistics at the University Paris Cité. In this talk, uh, Benoit Krabi will explore the possibilities and limits of language, of large language models like ChatGPT for linguistic research. Large language models have the potential to transform the way we study language, allowing researchers to analyze vast amounts of linguistic data and test hypotheses on a, on a scale that was previously impossible. However, as with any powerful technology, there are also limits and potential risks associated with the use of large language models for linguistic research. Benoit Krabi will discuss the limitations in terms of understanding and reasoning about language. So please join me in welcoming Benoit Krabi, who will share with us his thoughts and perspectives. Okay, so that's, that's, that was mostly ChatGPT, I have to admit. Okay, thank you. I will start, I suppose. Yes, uh, please. 
So yeah, uh, today the talk is about the question of whether, you, so you have uh, probably all of you have seen uh, the buzz around uh, language models in the press. Uh, and in fact, this is actually a very uh, strong advance in uh, natural language processing and computational linguistics. And in this talk, I will essentially uh, uh, try to figure out whether we can uh, not only use these uh, language models for uh, uh, applicative and industrial uh, uh, applications, uh, but uh, also uh, for the study of uh, language and uh, language uh, the, as, it, as itself. Uh, so that's basically the topic of linguistics. So I will start. Uh, I started by interviewing ChatGPT uh, on human language. On human language. Uh, so uh, here is the question I asked. Uh, so it's uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and uh, the thing is that what is really new in natural language processing in there is that uh, a chatbot is able to generate uh, such a text uh, uh, in uh, as an answer to a, a, an open question. So that's uh, about a random topic for him. Uh, and uh, he's able to generate a text uh, which uh, as a very good structure, and we can refer to knowledge of the world. Uh, this is something uh, that was not thought to be possible uh, a few years ago. Uh, so that's really the, the 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 main difference. And as you can see, the text makes more makes more or less sense all around. It's not uh, it, it's quite uh, uh, you can believe in it. Um, now. Um, my question in the talk will be really the focus is whether uh, uh, ChatGPT and related models uh, can help us to acquire some more knowledge on language. Now, here is another question I asked him. So that's uh, uh, that's a question I will come back to in the later in the talk is whether the, the ChatGPT knows some uh, rules of the grammar of French. Uh, and here uh, I ask him to uh, provide a classical rule, a classical problem of agreement uh, in French, where uh, when you want to uh, perform the agreement with the past participle with, uh, uh, in case there is the direct object. So he starts by providing the rule actually. Huh? Uh, so if, if you look at the beginning, it says basically that uh, you have an agreement uh, with the past participle when the direct object comes before the verb in the sentence. Uh, so that's the general rule of for ag agreement with the so-called participe passé. And after that, he will, and so that's already impressive that he actually structured the text like that. Huh? Uh, and then he provides um, the details of the rule case by case. So he says if the direct object is feminine, then it, in, uh, it agrees in gender and adds an E at the end, blah, blah, blah. And it, it does that for all the cases. So that's uh, that's a very nice. So apparently the model has some knowledge of grammar. Um, and what you can see, however, is that uh, the model is sometimes not very consistent. So he says, he insists uh, that the rule, the direct object must come before the verb. And when he provides example, as you can see, the direct object comes after the verb. So that's really statistical stuff, you know. Uh, everything looks nice, the sound, uh, but uh, in fact, it does, it does not provide the right examples. So uh, you have a wrong example here, another here, uh, and here it's another, it's a mildly good example in the sense that he, uh, he says that the, the, this letter is a, is a la. Okay, but in any case, uh, somehow the, the model seems to have knowledge of some rules of, uh, of, uh, of French grammar. So uh, really the question I would like to start with is how did, did, we, did we get there? So how, how, is it, how come is it that we come with such models uh, for uh, language? Uh, so I will do a, a, a small history of the field of computational linguistics with respect to language modeling to figure out uh, uh, how do we get there? Then I will say a word about what are these language models, uh, about uh, GPT, but also other, like, oops, sorry, like Sesame Street models. Uh, then I will say, uh, I will detail in three and four, 
uh, applications of these language models. We, al we have already done uh, in uh, for, for linguistic purpose. So that will be about a fine tuning problem. And then I will come back at the end on a more foundational issue related to uh, language models and language structure. So language structure, I will insist on that in a few minutes, that it's really central when you, you are interested in linguistics. So how did we get there? Uh, in fact, as far as I know, you can uh, start the story of computational linguistics uh, in uh, the 1950s. And in the 1950s, the context was the context of the Cold War, uh, where the, the purpose was to translate a Russian uh, uh, text, let's say, to English. And in the beginning, the, the, the first uh, experiments uh, were uh, uh, essentially made by translating uh, on a word-to-word -word, uh, basis. Uh, and so um, the word-to-word -word translation is typically a wrong way to do uh, machine translation. Uh, and here is an example of that. For instance, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, if you translate that literally and uh, naively to Russian and then back to English, the, the, that, the, these classical examples, then you have uh, like the spirit is translated as vodka, willing as strong and blah, blah, blah. And you get a, a pretty funny a translation. Uh, but beyond these uh, funny examples, uh, for instance, uh, you might ask, and that's the question uh, in the first place, uh, uh, machine translation was deemed as a very, uh, very hard problem uh, in, in already in the 1960s. Uh, and so uh, the question uh, here is illustrated, why is it hard? Uh, one of the examples, the important example is the following one. So that's Lytton John was looking for his toy box. Finally, he found it. The box was in the pen. And in fact, uh, the problem for the machine translation is to find out how to translate the pen. So there is the natural translation in French, which is the tool for writing, uh, a stylo. But there is another meaning of pen in English, which is uh, blanc clos. So that's uh, something you, you, you uh, which is around something else. Uh, and in fact, uh, to find out whether the the translate the preferred translation is the first one or the second one is pretty difficult for a, for a computer. For instance, if you take a Deep L, which is one of the best translators nowadays, he's still wrong. He translates the pen uh, in as a stylo. And uh, uh, so that's uh, me, uh, I, can, I can translate more or less correctly. And, and why uh, the, does the computer make this uh, error? Because he needs some sort of world knowledge to do that. He needs to, 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 to be aware that a box cannot live in a, in, a, in, a, in a stylo or in a pen, okay? And so there is in the first place an observation uh, for the modeling language and uh, machine translation in particular is that in, you need to somehow have some common sense knowledge, some knowledge of the world, some knowledge of some implicits. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the important issues when you do language modeling, uh, at least in computational linguistics, is to be able to handle that. But there are other issues. And the other issue um, comes, I think you, we can trace it back to the 1956, and in fact, in 1956, it's a very important uh, year for um, um, symbolic artificial intelligence. So in fact, it's the, 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 the year where uh, you have the Dartmouth Summer School, where in fact, all the founders of artificial intelligence, of uh, let's say symbolic artificial intelligence were present. And this is also the year where uh, Chomsky wrote a, a very important paper called Three Models for the Description of Language. And in fact, it's really the idea that you can uh, do the modeling of language with a structure, with symbolic structures, such as trees as depicted here. Uh, and you, you can do that in a mat mathematical way. So that's uh, really the, the, impo the important idea at the beginning of lingu formal linguistics. And for instance, here, uh, you can represent sentences as trees. For instance, you have the, a woman is a, is a, is a noun phrase. Uh, the verb with the noun phrase uh, makes a verb phrase. Uh, here you have another noun phrase, and all of them are, do, are making up the, the sentence. 
Okay, so that's the idea of having a structure. So sentences are not just a sequence of words. These are structured objects, such as trees, for instance. And also, later on, uh, the symbolic methods um, uh, added the idea that uh, you can compute uh, the meaning of a sentence from its structure. So the structure is really the, the building block for building the meaning of the sentence. And these are the words of Richard Montague, for instance, that are very important. And they allow to uh, build bridge uh, with also the semantics of formal languages and uh, formal language are typically programming languages. Uh, the mechanism used in linguistics for building semantics are, uh, share a lot of properties with uh, mechanism used for building the semantics of a programming language, for instance. And uh, this symbolic AI uh, time uh, led to a very important, uh, for me at least, a very important result, which is uh, Schrodlu. Uh, it's uh, in fact a first chatbot that was very uh, working very well uh, uh, at that time. And you can look on the internet if you want to look at demonstration of Schrodlu. And in fact, it's a very nice chatbot. Uh, you can really talk with him and ask him to move uh, the blocks that you have in a, in a small uh, in a small uh, scene. Uh, you can uh, ask him questions about uh, how the blocks are on the scene and so on and so forth. So that's what you can see here. And uh, quite honestly, you don't need a GPT to run short blue. Uh, you can really write it with symbolic rules. Well, so, so far, so good. Uh, so why do we come to chat GPT and so on? The problem is that it doesn't work and, uh, if you want to generalize short blue. So short blue, you, it's something that you can do with symbolic AI because you are on, in a closed world with a few blocks, uh, a few colors, and uh, the physics of this, uh, the, this, these blocks is, is easy to, to implement. And you can, in fact, design manually symbolic rules for, for, uh, for uh, designing the chatbot. The problem is that, in general, uh, nowadays, we don't want to uh, uh, model language for small words and closed worlds. We want to be able, as ChatGPT does, uh, model language in an open world where we can query the, the chatbot any, any question of any kind uh, without restriction of a specific uh, uh, environment or specific scene. So um, the thing is that uh, doing uh, generalization with symbolic rules is just something totally hard. And this is the story of about uh, uh, 30 or 30, 40 years of uh, research uh, that uh, basically I'd try to address this question of generalizing from the closed world to the open world. So among the, the difficulties that are when you want to move to the open world, there are the problems of ambiguities. So here I take a simple example. Uh, if you consider uh, John eats a salad with a knife or John eats a salad with tomatoes. And then you ask the question, with what instru instrument does John eat the salad? With a knife, that's uh, for the first question, it seems natural to, to answer that. Uh, and for the second one, uh, most humans would say uh, that, the, that the question is ridiculous or whatever. But for a computer, it's not obvious at all because the structure is the, exactly the same. Uh, you have uh, the, the tomatoes uh, uh, in place of the knife. But uh, for the, 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 to, to tell the computer that tomatoes are not an instrument, uh, it's something uh, which requires to uh, design database uh, uh, or to, to, to build into the model some notion of world knowledge again. And in fact, uh, it has been people have tried to do that in a symbolic way to create a database uh, uh, Im implementing uh, this kind of world knowledge. But all of the attempts have failed because this knowledge is often a knowledge that is implicit to humans as well. And that is not uh, typically not an encyclopedic knowledge that these are things so trivial that you don't, people don't care to, to write this kind of knowledge in an encyclopedia. So in fact, for a computer, there are ambigu ambiguities everywhere as soon as he doesn't know uh, the context and the world. Um, so in this context, uh, instead of trying to model a database of the, the, the world knowledge, uh, computational linguistics came with uh, statistical solutions. And so the, uh, instead uh, of using database, uh, basically we came with 
uh, uh, machine learning methods in order to solve these uh, ambiguity problems. Um, and in fact, um, the, uh, the idea is uh, that you can represent the structure of a sentence uh, with, uh, let's say that here is, it's a dependency tree, okay? Uh, where you have the relationships between the words in the sentence. And in fact, the statistical systems will try to predict the dependency tree with statistics, uh, which says that it is very likely that, let's say, a hearing uh, is a subject of, because you, you learn a regularity on the structures, but you don't try uh, statistically, but you, you don't try to have an exhaustive uh, um, a statistical database. And in fact, for solving the ambiguities I had before, in fact, uh, the, 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 the statistical system has to predict one tree or another, another uh, in order to, 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 to provide a solution for the ambiguity resolution problem. Um, the problem, if you do that, is that it's really hard to get the data to train such a probabilistic system huh? because you will need to have people that will take text and do the annotations uh, that provide the, uh, the, the correct structure for the sentence in order to train your statistical models. Of course, uh, th this has been done actually in, to a very large extent for uh, many languages, such as English, French, German, and so on and so forth. But in any case, it remains very costly and time consuming to get. So annotating such data is, uh, is really a very long story. Uh, and even if you do a lot of, uh, of work, these uh, annotated corpora will remain small. Uh, uh, to give you an order of, uh, uh, of, uh, of magnitude, uh, for English, uh, you have corpora of about 40,000 sentences annotated with such structures. For French, there are corpora with 20,000 sentences about. Uh, but 20,000 20, sentences is a lot, but if you compare to the, 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 global, the, the web, let's say, or to the, the production of language, but the possible production of language, it remains very small. And so, uh, at this point, I would like uh, to make clear that uh, when you do computational mod modeling of language, there are really two things that uh, you want to care about. One is about modeling structure, and uh, that's typically a business that is of interest when uh, you, you are a, a linguist or something like, like that. Uh, and there is also another dimension which is important, uh, that is uh, the rest. Uh, that is modeling uh, where knowledge, common sense, and things like that. Now, I would like to uh, come to the GPT and language model models uh, that are used uh, currently. In fact, uh, the GPT and current language models build on a very old ID. Uh, this is the ID of Markovian language model, so it's a 100 old ID. Uh, and what they try to do essentially is to model the probability of a, of a, of a sentence uh, as a sequence of words, and they use uh, basic rules of probabilities to uh, compute this probability. And basically, a language model will essentially estimate a conditional probability, uh, which is about um, predicting the, the probability of the next word given a prefix. Okay, if you know. Uh, uh, two or three words, then you try to predict the next one and to, to get the probability of this uh, following word. And in fact, these uh, Markovian language models were really, uh, the, the, uh, really uh, designed to do uh, machine translation, automatic speech recognition for years. The, very di the difficulty that uh, people had uh, historically is that these probabilities were estimated by counting uh, in a corpora. And in fact, uh, as I will show you in a few seconds, when you design a language model, what is really uh, important is to have the larger context possible. So uh, the more context you have, though the, mo the most words you have in your context, the better your language model. But when you do counting, in fact, uh, most of these long contexts are uh, very hard to count because you don't find many of them in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in text. So here is uh, uh, an illustration of what is the importance of the context size in language models. So here is a, a, a language model which basically um, uh, has no context. 
uh, it just uh, generates random text. So you basically at each step, you will uh, take uh, the probability of the, of the, the word uh, that you estimate from a uh, corpus. Uh, and then you draw uh, from this di probability distribution a, a random word. And so when you have no context, it's just a salad uh, of uh, things. But uh, when you have uh, more uh, context, so with larger context, as you can see, you draw there from the conditional distribution. So you have your prefix. And then given your prefix, you try to generate, you, you randomly draw the, the next word. Then uh, you see that it starts to, 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 to look like some uh, regular English as soon as the, the context increases. So this idea of context will come back in a few seconds. And in fact, uh, the current language models are built on two IDs, or two, there are two, two the, the, that takes in two times. Uh, the first uh, will be to uh, create a mathematical representation of words as vectors. Um, in fact, um, the idea is that uh, when you want to do modeling of language, uh, the, the basic problem that you have in the first place is uh, how you will represent these uh, strings of characters uh, in a mathematical way. And uh, the, the current way to do that is to build dictionaries that will map the strings to some vectors and with the uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, uh, words appearing in a similar context in text will have similar vectors. Why is this? Is there this hypothesis? It is because we observe that words that are that appear in similar context have also similar meanings. So that's a, a, a very uh, recurrent hypothesis when you do uh, language modeling. Okay, and so um, basically, uh, in around 2013. Uh, there has been uh, some methods uh, that have been designed to, uh, to, to, to generate su such dictionaries where the strings are mapped to these vectors, which are similar if the words occur in the same, in the same context. This is called the word embeddings. And so the, the, the idea of word embedding is also an old one, but what has been really done recently is to find methods that scale up to very large corpora. Uh, so that's uh, one of the... The, the, the improvements of the last years. So the thing is that if you have uh, uh, dictionaries mapping words uh, to their uh, vectors, there is still the problem of ambiguities. Uh, for instance, the, the string avocat is in fact has two meanings uh, in, in French. It's either the lawyer or the, uh, the advocado. Uh, and with the kind of method I'm talking about, there is no distinction, with, distinction between these two senses. So the, the string avocat will be mapped to a single vector, which somehow conflates the two senses uh, of the word avocat. And in fact, the second step that took place in uh, uh, generating the, the, the new uh, recurrent, uh, the new uh, language models is to uh, get longer contexts. And for instance, uh, the, 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 the recurrent mo mo language models are, are nowadays able to model an, uh, a non bounded context. So instead of uh, predicting a word at some position in the sequence uh, given the, the, the few la last words of the prefix, uh, nowadays uh, the, uh, the, 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 the recurrent models are able to take into account the whole context of the sentence. From the first word to the to the the, 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 the last word already uh, predicted, and so uh, that's uh, something uh, important because it allows to contextual contextualize the embeddings. So imagine that you have a sentence such as this one. Uh, in fact, I represented in gray uh, the embeddings of the words, and the recurrent language model will basically integrate the embedding in the word into a memory at each time step, and then update the memory. Uh, and at each time step, the, the model will also try to predict the next word. And that's the way, uh, basically, uh, a recurrent neural language model works. But what is important is that the uh, embeddings, the static embeddings of the words are contextualized because you somehow combine uh, the uh, embedding of the first word in the memory, then the embedding of the second word, and it creates an embedding of the context. Okay, um, and so that's uh, uh, so, so some important idea as well. 
Uh, this one, I, I think I will skip. It just explains that um, when, um, it, when we used counting to estimate these conditional probabilities, uh, we, could not, we couldn't uh, take advantage of similar contexts. For instance, if you uh, pr predict, you want to predict the cat given the prefix the black, okay? Uh, in uh, historical methods, we couldn't uh, take advantage of the fact if we have seen that the gray, that there is the gray and then cat, we cannot transfer the counts to uh, the black, okay? Because it's, a, it's another string. And current language models can really uh, take advantage of counts found for uh, synonyms or words with the same meaning in order to, to predict uh, the, 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 the next term. So uh, at, at the moment, uh, the, the trend uh, in, uh, in current language model is uh, to use these contextualized language models. And in fact, most of the progress has come from uh, using increased context size. So the, 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 the size of the context is larger and larger uh, in, in recent models. They also are all trained on extremely large data sets. And the purpose and the motivation be beyond the design of these models is essentially uh, efficiency on uh, uh, GPU processors. So the idea is that you want to achieve parallelism. So the, why do you want to achieve parallelism? Because you want to be super efficient uh, in order to process a larger and larger data sets. Uh, and the, the thing is that also it's, uh, uh, so certainly the, the first uh, success of unsuper unsupervised uh, methods or uh, self-supervised methods in linguistics in the sense that you don't need manual annotation. The only uh, data required to train such a model is a raw text. And we will come back in a second about that. Uh, the design of these models is absolutely not motivated by uh, any consideration from linguistics. So how do they, they, they are trained? Um, they, basically, there are two families of models at the moment. You have the, the BERT family, which is also called the masked language model family, where the model, in fact, uh, is a neural network that will try to predict uh, a, a, a word missing uh, in, a, in a gap. So if you have a sentence, you mask a word and you ask the model to guess it. So that's one family. You have another family, which is the GPT family and Helmo, uh, and the, the language model, traditional language model family, which amounts to given a prefix in a sentence, it tries to predict the next word. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, this game, uh, which is kind of child game, uh, is formalized as the optimization of a neural network. So if you just want to have an ID, of what's going on in, a, in current language models. So for instance, for the mascot language models like BERT, um, the idea is that you will compute a similarity between the words in the, in the sentence. And then you will predict the embedding or the contextualized vector of a single word. So if you, if you, you are in the Philippe de Gamme paradigm, you will mask, you will, uh, the, the model cannot see uh, the missing word and you ask it to predict it's embedding given the context only. And the context will be a basically a weighted sum of the surrounding uh, embeddings of the, the words around. Uh, when you look at autoregressive models, uh, the, the story is very similar. So you will predict the embedding of the next word uh, given the embeddings of the words in the prefix. And this is basically a weighted sum uh, of, of, of the inputs. And here, what you see is that the process is repeated several times, uh, and I won't detail that in this talk. Um, okay, and so these similarity functions are called attention. And so attention is really uh, the building block of all the current uh, language models uh, we, we have. Uh, so far, so good, but uh, why do we care about models uh, trying to predict the next word or uh, predicting a missing word? We don't really care about what they, they predict, actually. What we care about is about their representations. So what kind of embeddings or vectors they will build in order to uh, do the prediction. Uh, and so a language model is, in most of the case, used nowadays as a function that will map the language strings 
to these contextualized vectors. And the actual prediction that it does are, are in general, of uh, less importance. Um, and so the fact that you uh, are able to uh, train these models on very large amounts of data is something that really uh, uh, probably helps them to acquire some uh, knowledge of, of the world, of the world knowledge. Uh, but these are obviously uh, correlates of this world knowledge uh, and also of common sense. So it's kind of uh, provide the solution to the problem we had in the first place about uh, uh, modeling this common sense and world knowledge issues. Uh, but uh, this is clearly an approximate uh, knowledge and incomplete. Uh, and how, do, how are they used uh, currently at uh, these models? Uh, in down, that's in downstream, down, downstream tasks. So suppose you have a language model uh, that is uh, uh, whose task will be to do question answering. How do you use this? Use it. You basically will uh, uh, run the model on a text and acquire a vector for every token, every word in the text. Uh, and then given that you have an input, uh, like you have a, a, a vector representation of your text uh, and maybe a vector representation of a question you, are, you want to ask on a text, basically you can uh, use this uh, representation as input to some sort of classifier that will, for instance, in this case here, extract the answer from the text uh, so that's a typical. So the typical use is really to use the language model to encode the text in a, in a vector form, and then the, this vector form is uh, typically used as input to a classifier or, or some sort of predictor. Um, so yeah, that's something I will come back later, but. Uh, uh, the thing is that the, adv the ad recent advances in language modeling have basically forgotten the idea that um, the models are time dependent. So Markovian models or uh, recurrent neural networks and so on are basically time dependent. Uh, and this is in fact an important property when you want to do uh, linguistic or uh, uh, cognitive like models. And in fact, uh, because they want to scale up, uh, they somehow uh, re remove these time dependencies. Uh, this is typically the case when you use a BERT-like language model. So BERT is basically predicting the vectors of the whole sentence in a single step. So there is no time uh, effect. And the GPT models basically are uh, architectures with, with no time as well. Uh, there is a simulation of time uh, in the implementation, but uh, essentially that's not a time-dependent architecture. Uh, so these are really designed to be run in, in parallel. And uh, as you can see, this design allows to scale up the models uh, in the recent years. It's very impressive. Uh, here you have the number of parameters for a model. Uh, and uh, in fact, also that you have a very uh, larger and larger training size, uh, so training data set size, uh, because if you want to have more parameters, then you uh, want to have more uh, training size. Um, so ChatGPT is essentially a, a language model, like a, a, an incremental model, language model. So this, this kind of thing, it tries to predict the next word. It, it has plenty of parameters. Uh, and uh, there is something more. It's uh, the fact that it uses re reinforcement learning uh, with human feedback. So people, people among you who have tried uh, ChatGPT, uh, in fact, uh, can have seen that you they ask you whether you are satisfied or not with the, the, the gener generated text. Uh, and in fact, they use that uh, as an annotation to, to, to have an information whether the text is, uh, is good or not. And they can uh, uh, use uh, this uh, feedback in order to improve the model. Uh, and so when you use these models, it's not just language modeling, it's something uh, slightly um, substantially uh, different. Uh, because you have this reinforcement learning. Now I will say a word about the use of these language models uh, in, uh, in linguistics. So I, I first uh, um, provide uh, uh, the context. Uh, so in fact, what we observe is that we can easily train, by easily, not, not that, but it's possible to get language models trained on uh, so-called well-resourced languages like uh, say English, you have plenty of English on the web, like French, Chinese, German, whatever. Uh, and in fact, there is a challenge uh, in linguistics is to get 
uh, uh, models for low resource languages uh, because uh, you would like to do a, 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 to to get for to do analysis on uh, the diversity of languages or on, on historical states of languages. So, for instance, um, in uh, in French, uh, you have uh, this uh, uh, this question of annotating corpora. So, annotating corpora is basically uh, uh, given your row sentence to uh, put the tree information and providing the structure of the, of the sentence. Uh, and uh, so there are interests uh, for, to do that for, uh, let's say, old French, so uh, the French from the Middle Age, uh, for uh, Middle French and uh, different uh, states of the, of the language. Uh, because uh, there are actually questions such as uh, why do the word order changes from the old French to the modern French and, and, and related questions. And in fact, you can use these uh, very large language models to provide annotation for old French, which is a, a language where uh, there are no annotators, in fact, uh, because it's uh, middle age. Um, and uh, this is just a result that, so I won't detail the, the particularity of old French right now. But basically, what you can do is to take a language model for modern French. Uh, so that we have a design model such as this for, for modern, modern French. Uh, and uh, you can adapt them to old French. So you have a, already a, a model with a full parameters. And then the fine tuning is basically trying, given uh, the, 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 the model of modern French, to try to uh, adapt it or to fine tune it uh, on old French. So on old French, uh, you have uh, the whole corpus is about 55 megabytes of text. Uh, and basically, you have uh, pretty much all the text uh, we, we can find in, in, in old French. And if you do that, so if you, you, you modify the language model, so you, you fine tune it, you adapt it to old French, then you can provide very good annotators. So that's what I try to illustrate here. Um, where, for instance, if you try to uh, learn some uh, uh, parser, so something that predicts the structure of old French and a given uh, sentence in old French that will predict the, the relations, the links here. Okay. If you uh, just uh, use the old French data, you have about 80% uh, of accuracy. So it's uh, the, the, the predicted structure is looking 80% uh, of the time similar to the, the, to the, the, the expected the correct structure. And if you do this kind of fine tuning, you basically uh, have about 90% of correction uh, in, in the results. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, something uh, which is uh, important because uh, it, it helps a lot if you want to design uh, correct data, it, it, it does 90% of the job. Uh, there are uh, similar issues uh, in uh, so called language typology. So that's the study of the diversity of languages. Uh, what we see here is that, um, in fact, if you take a language model uh, which works on speech and not on text anymore, uh, they have, in fact, very good representation uh, that uh, uh, predict somehow the phonological feature. So that's uh, uh, something that has been obtained on English, uh, on an, with an English uh, speech language model. And basically, uh, what you have in front of your eyes is a projection of the two dimensional projections of the embeddings of uh, uh, sounds, okay? Uh, and uh, what you can see here is that uh, the, uh, these projections have a, a relatively uh, good structure. So uh, you have, uh, the, when you have a vowel, uh, you see that the vectors of the vowels are uh, uh, relatively uh, have some structure. You have the same for the, 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 the plosive, uh, where you have uh, the, the, the representation are similar, uh, but you have also uh, nasals, for instance, which are in, in both sides of the plot. Uh, but basically, there is a, a pretty good structure that is found naturally by uh, language models. Uh, and so uh, about the questions that are currently uh, under investigation, is that given that you have, uh, uh, let's say, about 40, 50 languages which are, which are found on the web and are, where we can easily train language models, uh, how can we transfer uh, the knowledge of language that they have acquired to uh, these uh, typologically more rare language where you cannot expect to train such a, uh, a model? And so they're, they're, these are part of the questions that are, uh, I think, important for the future 
uh, whether we can, in fact, transfer models and provide annotation to, uh, to very rare languages uh, and provide ways for linguists to study them. I would like now to um, move to the question uh, of language structure, which is a very uh, important question, I think, for linguistics. Uh, here, I just asked ChatGPT again uh, whether he is able to find some structure in text. And here, the question is uh, starts with anaphora. So uh, I asked him what is the antecedent of the pronoun it in a text, uh, which is a paricité, blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, and in fact, uh, here, I just designed the text in order that it could fail, you know. Uh, for instance, if you could find the Institut Physique du Globe, you could find uh, uh, Paris Diderot, you could find uh, uh, Paris Descartes. And uh, quite interestingly, I found that ChatGPT was pretty good at finding antecedents of anaphora in text. Um, uh, okay, but it's not all that good, you know, because uh, if you look here, I took the same sentence but I removed the pronoun it. And uh, anyway, uh, he found an antecedent for the non-existent pronoun in this case. You know? So that's uh, another issue with uh, the, the current statistical models. If they are, uh, they are bad when there are false premises, uh, but it basically is able to, 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 it's not too bad to find structure with anaphora. For syntax as well, so if, for, for instance, you ask him, uh, uh, what is the object, uh, the direct object in a sentence like the Data Intelligence Institute of Paris or several, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's not too bad huh? if I find something which is, uh, which is okay and, as an object. Uh, and he also explains that the other at the Université Paris Cité is not an object, but it provides, uh, so it, it's, it seems that there is some potential. Um, now, if we come to the issue of language structures, so the large language model like transformers of BERT, GPT, and so on, um, they are essentially not motivated by linguistic theory. Um, and contrary to linguistic theory, uh, there is no distinction between the language common sense issues and world knowledge and the structure. So uh, we have a mess in front of us when we, we want to do linguistics. We would like to isolate the, the structural aspects and to uh, get away uh, the common sense and well knowledge stuff. Um, so that's uh, one of the difficulties if you want to use these language models for analyzing la language structure, and if, if we want to analyze the structure of the language model. Um, there is also something which is uh, pretty annoying is that the progress in language modeling are also the result of modeling longer contexts. And if you look at the literature in cognitive science and uh, related to linguistics and to, to memory in general, in fact, uh, what is very striking is that the, the, this literature insists on the limitation of human memory. So the models that uh, are created have uh, more and more memory and more and more context. And in contrast with what we would like if we want to do linguistics is to have models we, which are most, more, more constrained on the memory. And then the last point, which, which is uh, well known, is that they require totally unrealistic amount of training data to acquire uh, some of the generalizations. So here, uh, GPT-3 is uh, trained on 200 billion tokens, uh, where a 10-year-old 10 10 year human is expected to uh, have seen 100 million tokens, and is very able to, to, to speak a language. So uh, you see, that's not, uh, not very totally compatible with linguistic, but uh, we think it's not hopeless anyway. Because, and so that's the why as a linguist and as computational linguist, we want to care because the uh, empirical, empirical adequacy is just outstanding. So that, that this is something that has never seen before. We have never seen before with any model of language. And so in uh, the last few minutes, uh, I would like to just uh, uh, ask a few questions. I will essentially ask this one, I think. Um, to which extent these models that are not founded with linguistic principles uh, do capture actually uh, anything similar to the, to the linguistic structure of language. To do that, I will just relate an experiment we made with uh, essentially by, by a PhD student, um, where uh, we compare uh, two cases of agreement in French, uh, because they reveal, uh, they, they, they are seen as a uh, features, uh, they, they, they highlight the structure of the sentences. 
So the, the examples we will contrast are these two ones. So the first one is a case where you want to perform the subject and verb agreement uh, in French. Uh, and the, 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 the superficially are far from each other. So here we have a relative clause uh, between uh, the subject uh, and the verb. The second example is uh, a little different, if I say substantially different in terms of structure, because here you have again a noun and then something to agree with the past participle. Uh, they are uh, far from each other in the sentence as well, but the structure of the sentence is uh, somewhat different. Uh, here, uh, the, the past participle uh, agrees uh, with uh, the object, which is itself. Uh, uh, gets its uh, uh, agreement from uh, the, the noun sha. Okay. Um, the question that we ask is whether uh, the language models are building structures that are exactly the same in the two cases, or that, are, or, or that, or whether they uh, build structures that are different. Um, because for the language model, uh, the, the only thing it sees is the, is the surface string where the, the, there is uh, two words uh, separated by a, a context. Okay. Um, the model which I, we used is a smaller model than ChatGPT, but it's a GPT-like model. So it's a not regressive uh, language model. Um, and so uh, we will ask, in fact, in, in this uh, test to, to, to figure out whether the, 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 the model is able to, to perform agreement. Uh, we will ask the model to, uh, to perform the task of predicting a word following a prefix. So here you have a sentence like Le Chac Marie aime bien. And then the model has to predict the next word. And he has to choose between two alternatives, like uh, the singular or the plural form or, or the verb uh, jouer. Um, so that's the task that we, uh, we, we, we want the model to perform. And then we will test. Uh, the model on uh, different of, of, on examples with different levels of uh, uh, difficulty. So to quantify the difficulty of an example, we uh, uh, use several heuristics. So for instance, uh, if in the example the the solution to the agreement or so the, the good agreement can be found by uh, checking uh, the, by performing the agreement with the first note in the sentence, then uh, you match the heuristic. If uh, you, the agreement occurs between the noun closest to the verb uh, uh, in the sentence, then you match the heuristic and so on and so forth. So the heuristics are basically uh, heuristics that are supposed to be typical of the heuristic, superficial heuristics that a machine learning model could find. And so the idea is that uh, the uh, higher the, the number of heuristics uh, that apply to an example, the easier the example. Okay. So here is an example uh, of the, this uh, heuristic ID. Uh, for instance, in, the, in the, the, the first example here, all the heuristics uh, apply. So all the shallow heuristics apply. And in uh, examples with zero, zero heuristics, none of the heuristics apply. So we ex expect that it's harder for a, a simple machine learning model to, uh, to, 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 to find a good solution when there are no heuristics that are applied. So what we observe is that uh, even if the, the in, in the non-trivial case, when you have no, so the example and the agreement is more complicated, the transformers are performing uh, very well. So that's here, that's the easy case uh, where, when you have five heuristics and when you have zero heuristics, the transformer is still performing very well on the subject verb agreement and uh, relatively honestly uh, on object verb, uh, uh, agreement, object, object pa pa past participle agreement. Um, so, um, and what you see is that the LSTMs, which are the other uh, recurrent models, which are classical, uh, uh, are, are performing much worse. Okay, so uh, they are much more, much more sensitive when to, uh, to, to shallow heuristic, apparently. Uh, so, the second question we ask is where uh, the number is encoded. Uh, so, uh, where does the model will encode the number? Uh, and so the, 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 the question, the method that we use is to use something called a probe. So uh, for uh, the model will build in fact a vector for each token. And the probe in fact will um, 
uh, we will ask him to predict the uh, correct value of the agreement for every word. Okay. So in order to find what, to find where does the, the model uh, is able to predict the correct number uh, and where he is not able to do that. And here, uh, what we can see is that when we probe and we ask the model to predict the number of uh, the agreement, so it is, here it's, it's going to be uh, plural. Huh? Um, before the, the word, the, 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 the Q word, uh, uh, the, Q, the Q plural word, what we see is that um, the, uh, the, the probe is basically not able to predict the number. What you see is, is the bias that you have, the natural bias for a uh, for number that you have in French. Uh, when you are uh, between uh, the, uh, the, the Q uh, and the verb, so in the yellow zone here, what you can see is that the model is very accurate at predicting uh, the number uh, between the, the, the two the, 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 in, in the actual, actual relevant context. Okay? And as soon as the model has seen the, the verbal form, like here, the, the, the past participle, then uh, the, its capacity to predict uh, the correct number becomes worse and worse. So what it means is that the encoding of the model, uh, the, the number is essentially encoded in the, uh, the correct zone uh, between the, 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 the noun and the verbal form in, in the two cases, either for the object uh, particip part participle or the subject verb. And finally, uh, we, the, we come back to the initial question, uh, whether uh, the model makes a difference when it, when it tries to do subject verb agreement or the uh, object past participle agreement. Here, what we do is that uh, we will prevent the model to look at some very important uh, words for performing the task. For instance, um, when you do object past, past, past participle agreement, uh, we might uh, prevent the model, we forbid the model to look at the uh, relative pronoun like the que here, which is critical uh, in, in principle for uh, getting the agreement. We can also uh, prevent the model to look at the antecedent of the re uh, relative pronoun and to figure out whether it works. So it's, it's like to, to, we, we try here to get some causal analysis. And what we can see uh, again, uh, I won't detail uh, much, but when you, uh, are, you prevent the model to look at the que, the relative que, or when you prevent to uh, look at the antecedent, what you observe, and in particular in the, in the R cases, is that uh, uh, when you have an object past participle, it fails, uh, it cannot predict the agreement anymore. In, instead, when you look at the subject verb agreement patterns, when you remove the que, so that's the gray bar here, the, the green bar here, you can see that uh, it still is still very good at predicting the subject verb agreement. And because in this case, the que is a, pre is a pretty useless uh, token for uh, Q for, 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 for performing the agreement. OK, so what we observe is that uh, apparently uh, they tend to uh, the, the model, the, the, the language model uh, tends to um, uh, make a distinction between the object past participle agreement and the subject verb agreement, which is totally unexpected uh, for a statistical model. Okay. Uh, I will just skip uh, this thing. Um, uh, I, I'm running out of time, in fact. So there is one thing I would like to say is that uh, there is a sort of also something very important uh, uh, for, I think, for the future of uh, language science. Um, in fact, uh, large language models are not only good for uh, uh, providing a representation uh, for uh, text generation, uh, for predicting uh, uh, like a linguistic task, but they are also very good predictors of human behavior and human physiology. Uh, and I think that's a very important uh, issue uh, for the future. Uh, and so uh, what, what do I mean here is that, for instance, if you take some uh, sentence uh, in English here and you ask uh, people to uh, read them uh, and then you record uh, their behavior, uh, for instance, with, uh, uh, by measuring their reading times or with an eye tracker, uh, and uh, or you could also use physiological measures such as uh, electroencephalogram, magnetoencephalogram, or uh, uh, fMRI. 
Uh, in fact, uh, what has been observed um, is that if you compare uh, the prediction of the models with the recordings that you've been performing, there is a very strong correlation. And so they are uh, pretty good uh, predictors of uh, uh, human behavior measures or human physiology measures. So this is a paper that has been, uh, 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 that the paper of Schrimms 2021. And what they show, I, I will go quickly, but that the most recent models are getting better and better predictors of human physiology. Here they aggregate a, a, a ton of, uh, of measures. So they made uh, like behavioral measures like reading times, but they also made uh, um, uh, physiological measures such as fMRI, uh, 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 MAG, and so on. Uh, but the, 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 the more recent models are becoming better and better predictors of, uh, of, uh, of these signals. And so I think it's a very important perspective for the future uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in language modeling. Uh, I will try to conclude. Um, so uh, I think the large language models uh, uh, will are, are surely uh, transforming the field of natural language processing and computational linguistics. Uh, so there are things that I didn't talk at all about today. It's the societal impact and ethical considerations. Um, there is a very strong, I think, uh, perspective uh, for uh, per providing uh, tools and uh, data for linguists for analyzing uh, rare languages, typology, and also old languages and things like that. Um, but um, as this, uh, these models do not tell us uh, much about the nature of uh, uh, natural language uh, because, in fact, there are no uh, li linguistic biases or linguistic theoretical insights that are built in the models. And so that's a pity somehow, but so we could fix that in the future. Um, they, uh, but they also uh, learn some linguistic generalization. And I think, and it's uh, an interesting idea that if we identify this generalization, that, that, may, that may also provide new insights on linguistic theory because the, the architecture of the model is very different. And typically there is a, a there are directions which are interesting uh, where we could uh, probably get insights on questions which are hard in linguistics traditionally, uh, such as text and dialogue structuration. Uh, so that, that I think these models might provide an interesting uh, insight. Um, and so that's something I didn't talk about, uh, but I'm really interested in working on. Uh, uh, it's in fact, uh, to figure out whether we can take the, the best components of the model, so the, that, the components that make them work uh, today, and to design alternative uh, of these models, which are more theoretically motivated. In fact, all these models that uh, we use now echo to a tradition in cognitive science uh, as well. Uh, th there, are, there are echoes, and uh, there, are, uh, there are surely uh, ways of connecting them, so that, that's currently uh, Ongoing, ongoing work and uh, the current perspectives. So I'm, I'm totally out of time, so I'm stopping here. Um, thank you so much. I think we still have time for, for some questions if anyone would want to ask a few. Yeah, actually I have a question. Uh, actually, I, I, I have two, two questions. Uh, thank, thank you very much for this uh, extremely interesting uh, uh, talk. Uh, so my first question is uh, with regards to what you concluded with uh, this, um, uh, these models trying to predict human be behavior. So it was not clear to me uh, what exactly are they predicting? They are predicting the signal. Uh, so here, for instance, uh, the, the, in the paper of Schrimpf, they actually, so you have the, 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 the stimuli, then they run, they, they add people uh, uh, reading the, 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 the stimuli, and then you measure reading times, uh, either with eye tracking or uh, uh, self-paced reading. But they also use fMRI and, and other uh, measures. And so the, given the, the model, you will try to, uh, given the model representations, right? Uh, you try to predict the signal. So uh, if you have uh, the, the vector for some word, you try to predict the reading time given your vector. So this means that uh, the, 
the models are, 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 are trained for this task as well, or not? Nope. Uh, they use a, a standard language model. So for instance, it's GPT here. Uh, and so the language model will map the strings to vectors, right? For each word, you get an output, you, you've got your, your vector. Then you, you probe it if you, you add a, like a fit forward network or a linear model and that will try to predict the reading time. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, yeah, I see, I see. And, uh, okay, for and, AI and so on, that's the same principle, uh, except that the, the task is more, it's more, it's more complex, but it's basically the same idea. So the model is not trained for predicting uh, directly a uh, fine principle, uh, the, the measure. It's a general purpose language model. Okay, uh, and one more question. Uh, so what exactly do these language models like uh, GPT uh, actually learn? So do they learn to predict uh, 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 the following words or do they also learn some kind of knowledge? Uh, so, for example, when you ask uh, uh, some 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 question, right? Uh, so, the output of this model is uh, simply a prediction of words, or do they put together uh, some knowledge that they have they they have somehow learned from uh, from the text? Uh, this is something I cannot answer, in fact, and for reasons that uh, we currently don't know. Um, to which extent they, uh, we currently don't know. There are plenty of papers for sure, huh? but uh, we, we, are, we, we are not sure whether we, we, it's, it's really hard to disentangle between what the model has learned about the common sense, world knowledge, and the structure of language. So it's, it's something uh, that, uh, for that there are plenty of papers at the moment. Uh, it's for sure that it has learned some common sense, some world knowledge, and, and uh, to which extent uh, the, the, so there are evaluation papers all around the place, so it's uh, it's uh, pretty hard to summarize. Uh, but uh, this is something that we currently uh, cannot easily disentangle, uh, and it's not obvious if if it's possible to disentangle that at all. But uh, that's for sure. Uh, for uh, let's say linguistic purpose, it would be interesting to uh, to study these methods in more details in order to be able to differentiate the structure of language or the nature of language and the common sense. But it's not, a, and it's, 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 I think it's interesting in itself to ask the question we can, we, whether we can do that at all. Uh, it, it's not obvious, in fact. But that's a fundamental uh, hypothesis in linguistics, this idea of uh, separating uh, the structure of language and the, the knowledge of the world and all the mess around. Thank you. I think Eric uh, has a question next. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Yes, that was a very interesting talk. Um, uh, so I have a, uh, yet another question about the slide that you're showing here in that follow up um, uh, to uh, to uh, Temi's question earlier. Uh, actually, I'm not sure I understood your answer to to Temi's. Um, I I initially thought that you were saying that. Um, Somehow, um, so the speaker would read a text, and as the text was being read, the model was able to, uh, I don't know, predict some, uh, some, so some correlation or correlated signal that uh, that was measured, the physiological signal that was measured uh, at the same time, and I guess that. Uh, Predicting this correlation is not surprising, I guess, as when you read a text, depending on the emotion you feel, or I don't know, the pace of reading and so on, there is some correlation and you are able to extract uh, um, some predictive power based, based on this. But uh, I, I think you're saying something much more profound uh, and uh, I, I don't see it actually. So I, I, if you don't mind, would it be possible to, to come back and re-explain what is really being predicted here and on which basis? Okay, just to, to come back to the, the basics. Um, the thing is that we use a pre-trained model, right? So the model is building uh, vectors for all the words in the sentence. And then you try to get your correlation given your the vectors generated by the model, okay? And your correlation, you, 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 you use whatever model, but typically that's a linear or a linear model that will use the vector and then try to predict the reading time or the whatever the measure. 
Uh, and that's uh, basically what is, is done in, in this paper. Um, and the fact that you find it is not uh, difficult to find uh, such correlation, uh, uh, you, yes, you might think about that, but uh, it's uh, not that easy at all, in fact, uh, because uh, la, la, actually the sentence has structure. Uh, and in fact, uh, that has been shown. So there are plenty. Uh, so that's the story of uh, psycholinguistics for, for at least some part of psycholinguistics for years uh, to show that finding this correlation is not uh, trivial. It's, it, uh, in fact, it's structure dependent. Uh, and so um, the fact that the model finds this correlation somehow suggests that he's also able to get uh, elements of structure. Uh, okay. So in fact, just maybe you know about uh, like reading times because you have read a paper on reading times that says that you can predict reading times with frequency of the words or things like that. Uh, but uh, actually there is much more. Uh, so maybe Barbara will want to add some details on, on that. So. You know, it's, it's just uh, going the same sense. It's, it's really, no, no question, it's just, of course, it's, uh, what exactly does correlate? Because uh, I don't know, reading times or increased bold signals in fMRI or things like that typically mean that something is cognitive more costly, uh, it's harder to process or something like that. And does that mean that the vectors actually uh, somehow uh, reflect also like ease of processing at some point at some point because reading times and 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 fMRIs are, are mostly processing data right or in particular EGs fMRIs it's a bit different but but EGs uh, and reading times are just reflections of ease of process how hard or how easy it is to 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 understand some part of of, of a sentence yeah and you say that that is somehow um uh, encoded in these vectors that's that's Pretty cool. Uh, but in fact, <laughs> from, from the paper, I cannot deduce uh, something like that because they, 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 as far as I remember, they don't provide that that level of detail. Uh, they they provide aggregations of all the measures. Uh, maybe if I, I'm not sure, I, I I didn't read the paper uh, like uh, a few like, like yesterday, but I don't think they provide the detail, uh, mm -hmm. and so I, I cannot answer. Uh, for the difference between the different kind of measures. You know, that's really a, a work where they try to show that there is potential to uh, use language models to analyze uh, the neural data and uh, behavioral data. Um, now, uh, I think there is interest uh, in, uh, because I, I, I strongly believe, uh, but it's a belief, it's not a statement. I, I didn't prove anything, but. Uh, I, I strongly believe that the, the models are actually encoding some kind of structure. That, that's 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 for, uh, but I cannot prove it. But I, I, mm. uh, yeah, and that means that since more structure, like roughly, may correlate with, with more cognitive cost. And yeah, mm. uh, I don't, yeah, maybe, but uh, yeah, I I, I I I I don't know why this correlation. Uh, the details of the correlation are not known uh, to me yet. Uh, and it's uh, actually an interesting topic uh, to, to, to find out. Uh, and this would require to design specialized data sets which try to test for that, but it's it's not it has not been done uh, to, to my knowledge. Uh, so, so. Um, so, yes. <laughs> do you do you have any time to answer one last question, or because if if not, we can move on. Uh, I do want because there has been a lot of debate around ChatGPT and ethics uh, relating to things like maybe plagiarism because of the use of large data sets, like writing fiction using AI, uh, all of that. Is there anything in the science of the construction of language model to support uh, either argument on the ethics side, or? is too it's too vague or do you have any any insight on that uh, sorry i think i i may i missed the beginning of the question so if you could sorry that. so there's been you know a lot of debate around chat gpt uh the ethics of it for writing fiction for example because of the use of large data sets uh how it, it would be it's not the same as someone like taking inspiration and writing down a story for example and so I was wondering if there's anything in the in the science and the construction of the language models that would uh, support any of the answers on the ethics debate around this. Like if there's anything to inform 
uh, either side of it. I don't know if that was clear. Yeah, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about this AI tick thing. Um, what's the the two alternatives? What so are... it's like, well, the two alternatives are it's unethical because essentially it's it's closer to plagiarism than it is to it's not actually creating stories it's not capable of that therefore it's taking from human creation and the other side is well it's not actually plagiarizing anyone and it's taking it's learning the same way that a human is learning from like by taking inspiration from books and and art and whatever uh and therefore we cannot consider that it is unethical to use it to write fiction i I see the question, but I, I'm not on the ethics thing. I, I'm sorry about that. But uh, on the science side of things, do you know if there's anything to like? Yeah, I don't know if it's okay. My, I think my question maybe was a little. I, I think really, if you want to to figure out, I didn't talk about that uh, in the talk, but uh, you you might also look at the hallucination effects in language models. Um, so to, to tell you the thing, when I prepared the talk today, I, I looked for examples about the, the, the universities of, of Paris and, uh, um, and the Deep Institute and so on and so forth. And you can do that at home if you like. Ask him questions about things like universities of Paris, uh, uh, the, the Deep Institute and so on. And you will see that actually ChatGPT is creative because he will tell you a story that mixes the University of Paris with Paris uh, Sciences et Lettres with Sorbonne University. And in okay. fact, it, it, uh, and, and what my feeling, but it's just, I didn't work on that seriously, is that when you ask a question on a specific topic, it will, uh, it, it will tend to uh, mix with topics which are uh, very uh, highly frequent in the data, somehow, somehow in the training data. And so there is a mixture of this. Uh, and I think okay. much of the issues are related to the fact that we don't, so chat GPT is uh, problematic because we don't know uh, on which data it has been trained. And in fact, there is no pie paper about that. So uh, I think the data is very important. Uh, uh, and I think uh, if you want to, to work on uh, ethical issues, you, want, you, you will want at some point to know on which data it has been trained. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's, it's very important. Uh, but I'm not sure that it was that was your question. But the, no, the, that did answer a is, good chunk of my question. Yeah, it's it's really statistical uh, stuff. Huh? Thank you so much. I think. Um, oh, there is another question from Mr. Nugai. Yes. Uh, sorry if it's a bit late. Uh, I saw the. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I saw that with time increasing and the increasing of performance of the model, the other thing is that all the model gets uh, very wider with the exponential increasing of number of parameters. So do you think to get more and more better model, it will possibly be by the increasing of the number of parameters or either like the last model um, it was by meta ie they show with seven billion parameter model they get pretty good results or do you think it will at the end only be on the number of parameter that we will be able to have a better model okay thank you uh, yeah, I have two answers for that. Uh, the first uh, one is that uh, currently we can uh, train uh, uh, BERT-like models, uh, not GPT, but uh, BERT-like models uh, with uh, very few data. Uh, in fact, uh, the, there is an old corpus uh, data set, let's say, uh, in, uh, in computational linguistic called the British National Corpus, uh, which is by nowadays standards very small. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I think, uh, a uh, few megabytes, but it has been designed uh, with uh, uh, the idea of uh, sampling the data very well. So th there is a lot of variation in it. And in fact, uh, that th there are papers that show that you can train very good models uh, on the very on much smaller corpora, but where the design is that there is more variation and not uh, like uh, all the time the same kind of data that you find on the web. Uh, and so that's one thing uh, you can uh, expect to. Uh, 
uh, have uh, models with uh, less data, so less parameters as well. Um, uh, and, I, and I think it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, that is really possible. Um, it's not obvious why we need so much data, in fact. Uh, and uh, there is, in fact, in my own experiments, we use models which are trained on much smaller data sets because uh, it's uh, less costly to train, whatever, and it uh, still works very well. So uh, if you want to use much more data, it's because you are you, you will want to to compete with uh, with Facebook or with uh, or with uh, uh, Google or whatever, you know. Uh, there is another uh, answer that I have for that. Uh, I personally worked on uh, very different topics uh, some years ago, uh, where uh, we design language models uh, that actually, as lingu linguistic linguistically inspired, where we were using tree structure in, into the into the models. And what I can tell you is that I can generalize much faster. Where, when, when I have priors on the structure of language, such as tree structure and things like that. Uh, the thing is that we cannot, uh, currently we, we, we don't have uh, solutions for scaling up these kind of models to the current uh, standards of uh, language models. But I think uh, the, the, the putting uh, better biases, uh, because here it's just really, um, it takes advantage of uh, parallelism. But uh, I think we could find solutions that uh, require much less parameter and much less uh, data uh, for training them. Yeah, so that's that's de really desi desirable when you want to do experiments. And for, for instance, if you want to compare models with different properties, currently uh, you don't want to train a GPT each time you want to test uh, the difference between two, two architectural, for instance, uh, difference between two models. So it's desirable to, 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 to have uh, solutions in that direction. I think more parameters and more, more training size really gets you probably uh, word knowledge, common sense, uh, more and more. Um, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure that just for the structure of language, you need so much data. Thank you. Okay. So I would suggest, so I think we are well over time. Eva, is your you're you're fine with that? I think we should yeah. just uh, close up here. So thank you so much, Benoit. Was thank it? you so much. Yeah. And uh, also for the discussions. I think it was really useful, great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a nice day, everyone. Uh we'll now be stopping the recording. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.